talk about the history of uh, these bug bounty programs or the crowdsourcing model that has uh, been uh, coming in this security field. So in 2004, Mozilla was the first company to get started with this model. And in 2010, Google joined it. Then we have Facebook and then Etsy recently, I mean, last year. So if you see from 2004 to 2010, uh, like in six years, there have been not too many major companies who have joined uh, bug bounty programs. But from 2010 to 2012, quite many companies have opted for this model. So that clearly shows how aggressive this model is going to be in near future because uh, it is beneficial for both the researcher and the company. So what's in for the researcher? So if you are in application security and you want to have uh, your researcher's gear put on or you want to do bug bounty programs, you want to participate in bug bounty programs, so what exactly is there in scope or in uh, there for you? So uh, there is research and learning obviously. So if you are testing the production application of say for example Google or Facebook, you are dealing with the best security minds who are there protecting that particular application. So you have instant recognition. These companies have their hall of fame. Uh, so if you report something, you are there amongst the top researchers. So obviously it looks good on your CV and obviously you can earn dollars. So uh, this company pay you per bug as well. Depending on the criticality of the bug, you can get paid. Benefits to the organization. Why would uh, a company having a security team in-house would go for something like crowdsourcing or bug bounty programs? It is very easy to manage, I mean, if there is a recession, you don't have to fire your employees. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, pay them regularly. You don't have to deal with all the obligations that comes with a regular employee. So it is uh, very easy to manage. It is uh, some form of continuous testing. Uh, right now as we speak, uh, someone would be testing your infrastructure, your web application from somewhere. You can actually market your security if you are there, you are having uh, a bug bounty program. So uh, since you are having a program like this, you are there uh, in the market and everyone knows that this company takes security very seriously. So uh, you can actually grow your own trumpet. Diversity includes techniques and approach. So someone in Russia might be having a uh, different methodology to test than someone in, uh, say, Barbados. So there is a diversity that can be there. So this is this is this is me. Uh, I hope you can identify. Uh, you can only pay for results. Uh, say, for example, if the bug qualifies, then you have to pay. Otherwise, you don't have to pay for it. Okay. So this was about bug bounty programs. So I was just trying to set the tone of uh, what exactly is a bug bounty program, what's in there for researchers and what's in there for the company. So this is my methodology which uh, I have been using for quite some time now and uh, I call it tried and tested path because if you want to participate in such programs, I suggest you strictly follow these. So uh, this is the overview, pick the target, uh, know the company search for recent acquisitions, less traversed subdomains, useful information, and obvious vulnerabilities. I'll get into these points one by one, what exactly is pick the target. So uh, you can actually go ahead and uh, there is a listing available on internet which talks about which all companies 
are having what kind of programs and if you click on one of these links you will be given with the, the scope what is the scope say uh, uh, in uh, Apple or Twitter so if you click on these links you will see uh, which all applications are there and what kind of boundaries they give and stuff so you can start from here like pick a target there is another very interesting portal which is there that is that goes by the name Synact. So it is kind of a broker between the companies and the security researchers. So if you are a small company that cannot host their own bounty programs, so you can approach these guys and they will host it for you. And likewise researchers can be part of this portal and uh, get notified as soon as uh, some bounties or some programs start. So any of these two things you can do. Second thing is knowing about the company that is similar to like when you start doing a penetration testing on application security, uh, black box testing. So you do a lot of research about the company, uh, what is the confidential data that, that, that if exploited can give you, can, can be more harsh. So uh, you start knowing about the company and then uh, you search for recent acquisition. So this is very important. So uh, when you do a uh, acquisition search for Google, you will see that Google has acquired almost a single company every month. And it is, it is obvious that the company that has been acquired by Google is not as secure as the Google's main domain. Though they do a lot of due diligence after the acquisition or before the acquisition, but obviously the company which came to Google as an acquisition is not as secure as google.com or maybe youtube.com or, uh, or whatever domains that Google has developed themselves. So start searching for uh, the recent acquisitions which might give you easy results like quickly rather than targeting google.com. And then uh, once you figure out uh, uh, the subdomain, uh, the domain itself, I mean like say for example an acquisition xyz.com, then instead of going and testing xyz.com, try obtaining a less traversed subdomain. Less traversed subdomain could be abc.xyz.com or a domain which you think would not have been tested that thoroughly or a less known subdomain. That actually increases your chances of getting something. So we are just trying here to narrow down our scope and we'll pick our target very judiciously so that we get more results out of our testing. And then uh, there are very simple Google Docs that uh, we call it Google Operators that you can use to further uh, reveal more information from Google about the company or about the pages or directories. So uh, by just doing site column xyz.com in title index.org, you can actually uh, get directory indexing or directory listing, which are cached there in Google. Similarly, uh, you can search for critical files inside xyz.com by just doing site colon xyz.com file type provide.txt or dot pf or dot xml. So it will just search for that particular file in xyz domain. So that increases the chances of finding any critical pages inside that domain. And likewise, uh, you can search for admin interfaces on internet for that particular domain. So if you want to search admin interface for xyz.com, you just have to use site colon xyz.com in URL colon admin. So that will give you pages which have slash admin in the URL. So sometimes you get the login page for the admin, which itself should not have been there. And after getting the login page, you can obviously try different stuff, like bypassing it using parameter manipulation or bypassing it using SQL injection. So chances of getting something on by doing this actually increases your chances of finding vulnerability. So I call it useful information. And uh, last is uh, obvious vulnerabilities. Okay, uh, how many of you know about uh, the Matt on story, uh, the poor wired uh, journalist who got hacked? Just because, uh, okay, quite a lot of people. Yeah, so uh, the story was like this. 
place, I mean, he uh, used to have, I mean, he still has, I think, uh, very interesting Twitter handle that says, at Matt. So his uh, problem, I mean, uh, the, the only thing that he did wrong was this thing, that choosing that particular Twitter handle. So some hackers actually got interested in it and they wanted to get hold of it, that Twitter handle. So uh, by just chaining a couple of obvious vulnerabilities, they were able to ha hack his uh, Twitter account, his Gmail account, his uh, me account, that is for Apple, and uh, they also use Amazon's blog. So uh, the thing was that uh, they saw his Twitter account and noticed that uh, it is linked to his Gmail account. So for getting inside Twitter account, they wanted to get inside Gmail account. Now in Gmail, if you uh, click on forward your password, it asks for a recovery email, which you would have set some time back while setting the account. And in the recovery email uh, uh, thing, you can actually see couple of characters masked and you can actually figure out which domain we are talking about or which uh, email he has registered into. So from there, they figured out that Matt has uh, registered his me account, that is Apple's account, as a recovery account at his Apple account, so that they can reset the password of Gmail account and send it to Apple's account, and eventually can hack his Twitter. So for hacking me account, they called the customer care. And Okay, before that, uh, they knew that for uh, resetting me's password, that is for Apple ID, they actually would require last four digits of your password, sorry, uh, credit card, and uh, your billing address. So, billing address, you can actually get it from Google, search the name of the person, and, and unluckily, Matt has a registered domain by his name. So, he, the, the hackers got it from the registrar information, the address. And uh, for getting the credit card information, they used another flaw in Amazon, which was you can actually register an extra card to your Amazon account if you provide the name and your billing information. So they registered a fake account, fake credit card in his uh, account and called the customer care guys again that they have lost access to it. So unfortunately for providing access, what they ask is last four digits of your credit card. So it was kind of chaining vulnerabilities in couple of big companies, which actually led to this flaw, which he had to suffer. And uh, they just wanted to get hold of the Twitter account. And uh, while doing that, they actually deleted all his uh, web presence, deleted all his emails, everything. And uh, one fine morning when he got up, he has nothing to do. So you can imagine how obvious vulnerabilities are, how critical. So these obvious vulnerabilities have come from my testing, which I have been uh, getting uh, as I do testing for different companies uh, as an independent researcher. And uh, default username and password, then you have sensitive information disclosure, admin interfaces, XSS, cross-site scripting, account elimination. So I'll show you examples of uh, these vulnerabilities which I have got, I'm sorry, uh, from my testing. So default username and password. I call it Google default because I got it in one of the Google's app application. And when we'll move forward, you see that uh, whatever I was telling about my methodology would actually hold true for each and every example. So I followed the similar path. I looked for uh, recent acquisitions and got to know that there is a company known as Invite Media, which uh, Google has acquired recently and uh, did the similar thing, uh, looked for less traversed subdomains, ended up in uh, discovering dashboard.invitemedia.com and it was a bid manager login, uh, some login page was thrown and as every hacker would do, I spent like 30 minutes trying to bypass it, uh, parameter manipulation, SQL injection, all those stuff. Then when I was about to give up, I tried admin admin and uh, as you would have guessed it by now, I was logged in and I could see all the critical uh, 
client data and uh, I could have done more stuff inside uh, after getting strike inside but I thought of uh, informing Google and immediately I informed him, informed them and then uh, those guys said what a catch. I sat back and started thinking was it really, I mean what a catch because uh, I just did admin admin and reported it to them and a couple of more things happened after that uh, which made me think more about it. I got a $500 reward which you, if you convert to Indian currency is, is a good amount and uh, was listed in Google Hall of Fame. So then I started thinking that uh, if Google can do this mistake, obviously there would be other vulnerabilities on web which are like obvious vulnerabilities which has a high impact but are very easy to find. Then I started on this journey and uh, tested a couple of more applications. There is something else which I got with PayPal. I call it PayPal PII. So what I did is used this Google Doc, secure.paypal.com, inuwallet.com and uh, it is basically an issue of Google caching wherein I was given with all the personal email addresses which is not considered safe if you are in a uh, payment uh, card industry and uh, can, can keep you in trouble if, uh, from a compliance perspective. Admin interfaces, companies actually love these vulnerabilities and if you report admin interfaces to them, they, they, they can pay you as well. They, they put you in Hall of Fame and stuff. So I did this thing with Apple, apple.com in URL admin, got uh, one admin interface and because of that they uh, put my name in their Hall of Fame. Obviously these are very easy to find but uh, from our side they would look uh, uh, that it does not have any impact but admin interfaces should not be there on the internet. Then there are accesses, that is cross site scripting. Freebase. Freebase uh, is an acquisition of Google. Again, uh, traverse the same path, look for acquisition. Jong is a service of PayPal. Again, accesses. Jagger is another acquisition of Google. So I have a lot more to show, but uh, considering the time frame, I could just compress a uh, few here. Cards.io, uh, it's again a service from PayPal. Okay, sorry, uh, there was iframe injection in this. And the last obvious vulnerabilities that you can get uh, many uh, such vulnerabilities is account immigration. So this one is uh, not fixed up till now, so I cannot disclose the name. Uh, obviously, responsible disclosure. And, uh, this one is uh, SoundCloud, which was a uh, inherent flaw in their redirection, where if you provide name of the author, the number two author parameter while they are redirecting, it dis dis discloses the author's name, which you can see here. So I was able to enumerate all the users from here. Okay, so this is what uh, is I call my methodology, and what obvious vulnerabilities you can look for and what path you should follow. So uh, where are we right now in terms of, if you are going to start this with bug bounty programs, you should know where, what has happened till now and uh, where are we in terms of stats. So this is the amount that Google has paid, only Google and there are uh, other companies which are there. Almost 70% of valid bugs are accesses. So you might want considering more of script alert XSS script tag. 44% of all the bugs are the first and the only bug sent by a researcher. That means as soon as people start doing research, they just send one bug and then if it gets disqualified or it's a duplicate, they stop. So that is what it says. So you need to keep patient. Okay, so are the companies with bug bounties or uh, implementing crowdsourcing model more secure? Uh, I would say they are.
are a step ahead, but suddenly there are roadblocks which they have to deal. What are the road roadblocks? One is uh, cross-border legal issues. Say, while testing, uh, since they allow, uh, someone in India would be testing an application of study in Singapore, or not someone from India, maybe uh, researchers around the globe would be testing that. And legal laws in companies, in countries differ. So while doing a corrective analysis, there might be some problem in actually leading to the correct answers. Duplicates. Uh, company hosting bug programs has to deal with duplicates. They might get same vulnerabilities multiple times. So they need to figure out, they need to have a proper team to do that. Fixing is very critical, I would say. You may get vulnerabilities from uh, researchers. And after getting it becomes even more uh, critical that you fix it on time. So you would get like 100 vulnerabilities in a day and then you have to decide on fixing timelines because you now know that it is known to the world and it becomes more critical and you have to prioritize your fixing efforts. This is obvious, false politics. Uh, people report anything just to be on Hall of Fame, just to earn, thinking that it might give them something. Uh, sorry for the picture. Responsible disclosure is uh, hard to comply with. That means uh, companies might consider that you are doing a responsible disclosure. You are not telling anyone what you are finding and reporting into the company. But there is no means by which a company can keep a check on you. And uh, because there are multiple researchers doing multiple things. And so responsible disclosure is, is really hard to comply with. Okay, so these were the things that uh, are considered roadblocks if you want to host your program like this. So what I think would be the future for such programs? It is best model of security testing for the reasons that we have discussed. You can do it as a community service, like report bugs to organization. You are actually making internet a safer place, reporting something uh, to the organization before. A uh, hacker does and exploit it. Win-win situation it is for researchers and company. If you are in bug bounty programs, you are uh, testing it for companies, you are actually increasing your security awareness because those are the best applications that are on production and you are trying to break into that. Okay, so this is what I have. Uh, these are the references. Thank you so much for attending. Any questions? Uh, zero day type of uh, 
uh, vulnerability. So it, sometimes uh, Google uh, they uh, decide on 